Hello. I've been thinking for a while that it would be cool if it was possible to simulate a combustion engine in Box 2D. Uh, and a little while ago I started sort of playing around with the scene just to see how if it was possible. And it actually seemed quite possible, so I really got carried away with it. And this video is to uh, just have a look at what I, what I did, what I ended up doing. Uh, so I'll start right from the beginning and explain uh, how each little piece of it works. And obviously to have a combustion engine we need combustion. <coughs> and combustion is burning gas. So what I started by making was this thing here. Uh, we have a, a little trigger and when the stick sticking up on top of the dynamic body at the bottom touches the uh, trigger here, a spark will fly out of this point here like this. So it's just a little circle and it flies around. Um, everything in this scene is at zero gravity at the moment. And um, it's quite heavy when it starts off while it's burning and then it sort of uh, returns to a very light density after that. So I'll just do that one more time and I will pause it because it's only burning for a very short period of time. So I'll single step that so we can see. So when it first appears it's yellow and then over the course of 10 steps it fades back into red. And while it's in this burning mode, like I say, it's very, very heavy. The density is raised to about like a thousand or two thousand or something like that. And when it's not burning, the density is one. Uh, so that uh, means that if it hits something like this block up here while it's burning, or while it's in that dense time, uh, it can really push it around. Maybe not one of them, but when you get a bunch of them, uh, they can really push that block at the top around. <coughs> So the next thing to do was um, to have something to play the part of fuel. So what I did here is set up a little, another little fixture here. This is like a carburetor uh, putting some fuel into the scene. And each one of these blue dots uh, has a certain amount of energy. And they're also zero gravity and so, so on. And these are all very light. These are one density of one. And the way this works is that if a burning particle during that very brief period of time, the 10 steps while it's burning, hits one of these fuel particles, the fuel particle will start burning as well. Uh, so we can see that here. I'll just pause that. So when we zoom out, we'll see that the particles uh, manage to move that block out of the way because there's a lot more of them now and we managed to burn about half of them. That was pretty good actually. So depending on... <coughs> it just depends if you get lucky you'll have a lot of collisions between the burning particles and the fuel particles and you'll get a, a, a high energy explosion like that. Uh, sometimes you're not so lucky. Uh, let's try one more time. Oops. So try again. So you can see some of them are burning there still. That was also pretty good, about half of them are burnt. Um, and we can do a few things to improve the burn rate. The most obvious one is to give these particles less room to move. So if we combine, confine them in a small space like this, we get, or we can get, that wasn't very good, but uh, potentially we can get a much more violent explosion to push the block away. So that's the basics of how these fuel particles work and uh, burning and so on. So taking these components here, the spark ignition thing like this, and this uh, kind of piston shaped thing and the uh, spinning wheel to turn the fuel on here, I made another scene in the shape of an engine. So the components here are pretty much the same. We have the wheel at the bottom here plays the part of the wheel that brings the fuel in. 
So the, the rate that the fuel enters the system is uh, linked to how fast this wheel is spinning. There's a piston there. And then at the top we have a, a bunch of little uh, levers and uh, valves here. So we have a valve on the left and the right and they are sliding on piston uh, prismatic joints and they get pulled back to close the gap. Uh, and they can be pushed by these levers at the top like that. And then <coughs> we have a camshaft at the top and the uh, collision bits on the fixtures are set so that one of the uh, protruding pieces of the cam interacts with one lever and the other one interacts with the other lever so we can get the, the timing right to open and close these valves like this. And then as before we have a ignition uh, edge fixture and the spark will be entering from here so let's uh, just try that. Oh we've got some fuel coming in. So it's the same thing. Uh, this time we have three spark particles. So there's three individual particles there. And <coughs> when we open these valves, when the valve touches this fixture here, uh, it becomes kind of um, all the contacts are disabled between the valve and the fuel, p uh, the uh, gas particles. So if I pull this valve open, the exhaust can escape out the top. And at the top of the exhaust pipe here, we just have a, a line that collects these gas particles as they go out and recycles them to be used again. So we can bring in the fuel like this. Hold on, let me just spin this up a bit. Okay, so we've got some fuel in. Open the intake valve. And if we get the ignition just, just the right time, it will explode the particles inside the cylinder to give us some energy and then if we open this at the right time uh, we can expel most of the exhaust out of the system. So that's the basics of um, how an engine works and <coughs> rather than operating everything manually myself like this all the time although it's kind of fun every now and then um, what we really want to do is have this keep running itself uh, without us having to touch it. So next scene, um, there's only one difference in this next scene and that is if I switch to this scene. Okay, so this is exactly the same as what we just saw except for now the crankshaft at the bottom, the large circle at the bottom, is connected to the camshaft at the top by a gear joint in a ratio of 1 to 2, so the uh, camshaft turns at half the speed of the crankshaft at the bottom. And I'll explain a little bit later what this block is in the middle, but for now it's not doing anything. Um, so, yeah, so now this should run all by itself, and I'll just give this a little spin, and then I'll take my hands off so I'm not I'm not touching anything now and we can see that the gas <coughs> intake and exhaust is working as it should and the engine will spin up to a speed by itself so this is just purely running on the energy gained by those particles pushing on the piston so I was quite pleased at this point um, that everything seemed to work quite well. It took a lot of tweaking, of course, to get uh, things to stay together. And because of the, the force of the explosions and such, I had to add a couple of extra fixtures at the valves here um, to stop the explosion from blowing the valves back out into the exhaust pipe. <laughs> So this runs, uh, it's running about 90 RPM at the moment, and it can go to about 100 uh, if you get a, a series of good explosions. So it, it just depends 
it's kind of random um, the way the particles collide with each other inside the cylinder. Sometimes you get a good burn, um, sometimes you don't. But generally it goes to about 100 RPM. Okay, we have another measurement here which is the torque. And let me just uh, start this again so I can show you what that is. When the piston pushes down to turn the crankshaft, it applies a little bit of torque to it. So uh, I can do this with my mouse, right? If I grab the crankshaft and I pull it down, I'm applying a bit of torque and then I let it go. And this <coughs> block in the middle of the crankshaft is connected to the circle by a motor joint. And they're both quite heavy, but when I grab the crankshaft and I shake it around like this, the motor joint has to do some work to keep the block and the circle in the same alignment. And we can measure how much work the motor joint is doing and put it in a graph. So I'll, I'll try this again. So you can see that when I grab and move this around, we're, we're making a graph of how much torque has been applied by me pushing it with the mouse at the moment. And we can see that when this engine spins up, oops, hang on, let me just uh, slow it down a little bit. So we can see with each firing of the cylinder, we can see the torque that it's been added to the wheel at that point. So sometimes there's not much. Come on. <laughs> okay, so you can see every every four strokes we get the explosion and that puts a little bit of torque into the flywheel at the bottom. And as this spins up to the the kind of the constant speed that we had before at about 90 RPM, we actually get less torque because even though we're spinning quite fast and we're still doing the same amount of explosion, because the wheel is already spinning we don't really need to actually do much work to keep it spinning at that speed. So if you've ever uh, been to a playground and pushed one of these things, it's kind of the same idea. You need quite a bit of energy to start it moving from standstill, but once it's already turning, uh, you don't really need to put in much extra effort to keep it turning. So that's why the torque tends to be close to zero once we're at this sort of constant speed like that because there's no there's no load on the engine we're just letting this flywheel at the bottom spin freely uh, and this number for the torque here is coming from the average of the last five seconds of the torque so the total width here from the left to the right of this yellow line is 10 seconds and so the five seconds is about the first half of this graph over here. Um, then the next thing I did was to graph the torque and oh, it's at zero at the moment so it wouldn't be much of a graph but what we can do is apply some friction to the block in the middle of the flywheel so that the engine does actually have to do some work in order to keep pushing it. And if we slowly and gradually apply a brake, um, we can get something like a dynamometer, or a dynometer as they're more commonly called, which is something that you can use to check the power output of your car or motorbike or whatever. Uh, and they work by applying, basically, you, you run the engine and measure how much force is being, or torque I guess, is being put into this rolling cylinder at the bottom and then you break, you put some load on the cylinders and then you can measure, um, here's another one here, and you can measure how much torque the engine is giving you. Um, so 
yeah, it's unfortunate that you can't just measure torque while the engine is running freely like this. You have to actually try and stop it or put some load on it somehow. Um, so, actually I have one more picture here. This is a kind of graph that you get when you do this measurement. Um, usually what they do is they start the engine running at sort of a not quite idling, a little bit above idling speed, sort of a, a mid-range mid running speed. And then they just try and make it go as fast as it can and they measure how how much uh, torque that the engine can put into that rolling cylinder at the bottom um, versus the load and then graph that with the engine speed at the bottom. So they're only actually measuring the blue line here and then the red line comes from multiplying the blue line with the the RPM at the bottom there. So that's how much power. Um, unfortunately with this little box 2D engine we can't start it from a low speed and um, work upwards like that uh, because it stalls if it goes too slow. So what I've done is we start at the free rolling speed so to, uh, so to speak so there's no load and then I've made it so that um, if you do this, if you download this app and you want to try it yourself, get the engine running at the top speed and then hit G to toggle dyno run, which all that does is it starts to gradually place load on the square block in the middle. And we can take a look at what kind of a graph that gives us here. Uh, the yellow vertical line is the current RPM that the engine is spinning at. So that over here we have 0 RPM over to 120 RPM on the right. And then these colored dots here represent uh, the red one is the actual measured torque. You probably can't see that in the YouTube video because they're faded out depending on how many measurements were placed at that position so it's probably quite faint and then the green one is torque and then placed on top of that we have the purple one which is the average of the torques measured in that region so it just smooths the graph out a little bit and then yellow is um, power so we can see that as we place more and more load on this engine the torque increases because it has to actually do more work to keep pushing it. And uh, I don't think I'll let this all run through in the video because it can take a while. But there will come a point when there's just too much load for the engine to keep running and it will stall. So it's not really the same kind of test that you do with these um, images that we have here because they're actually putting more fuel into the system to get the engine to spin faster but this is kind of like oops jumped the gun there oh well we might as well look at this while we're here um, the graph on the left here is obviously the one that we were just looking at a single cylinder engine and I also made a V-twin engine and a like a rotary four-cylinder engine here which are these are the graphs for those so we'll come back to that graph in a second um, okay so it looks like we got to a point where the engine stalled because there's too much load on it so that's c that's the um, result that we get for this and it's not too dissimilar to what we were expecting uh, so in my graph the yellow is the horsepower and the purple is torque. So it's kind of along the, along the right lines but um, yeah like I say it's a different a different way of measuring so I don't know. But I just thought it was interesting that you could even do this in box 2D at all uh, so I thought I'd try it. Anyway, you want to look at the other engines, don't you? Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is 
pretty much the same thing that we just looked at except duplicated uh, or rotated rather and they're using the same entry point for the fuel and the only only thing that's really different is that the positions of the cams and the position of the ignition trigger are a little bit different on each side so if I just give this a spin up to get it started we can see that it spins up much quicker because there's more firings per revolution, there's twice as many here you can also turn the um, shapes off to see exactly what the fuel is doing and I guess you could do other things like um, measure how many unburnt fuel particles manage to get to the exhaust and then you could like make some graphs about the efficiency at certain RPMs or something like that uh, yeah you could do make all kinds of graphs I guess So this one tends to run at about the same speed here as well, 95, sometimes 100 RPM if you're lucky. Um, and we're using the same amount of fuel per cylinder as we did for the single cylinder engine, which is why in this graph, that, so the middle graph is the two cylinder engine, uh, we get approximately twice as much power and torque from that engine. Otherwise the graph is yeah, fairly similar. Okay so the graph on the right here as you can see uh, twice as much power and torque again and that is this engine here. Just spin that up. Um, so obviously same thing again this is just the V-twin engine rotated 180 degrees um, and the firings are now set up so that every quarter of a turn one of these pistons is going to be adding energy to the flywheel and this spins up much quicker and it also can withstand a lot more load so you need a lot more braking force to stop it um, so like I say each one of these cylinders here is being given the same amount of fuel that the single cylinder was given in the first engine. So that's how we got these graphs here. Uh, so my point is that this graph on the left here was using a quarter as much fuel as the graph on the right. So it's not surprising that there's four times as much energy coming from that one. Uh, the interesting thing was if I arranged it so that each of these engines got exactly the same amount of fuel then we get a little bit more interesting graph here. Uh, for a start you can see that the overall energy output is much more similar now uh, but the fourth cylinder engine is still making better use of the fuel that it has and it's also a lot smoother. Um, you can see that the torque measurements for the single cylinder graph are a lot more erratic. So, oops. <clears throat> anyway, so um, just to finish off, I thought this little demo wouldn't be complete without a finale, which is this one. This is the V twin engine, and the biggest difference about this engine is, apart from the fact that it's placed in a boat. The whole thing now is dynamic. Uh, all of the bodies here are dynamic. And this is where the challenge really came in for building this engine because with the previous engines where they were um, where the main uh, body of the engine is a static body, it lets us do a few nice things like making these piston heads fixed rotation bodies so no matter what kind of explosion they get from the uh, fuel particles the pistons will never rotate they'll always slide perfectly up and down the cylinder in that in that position so that's quite a handy thing to be able to do uh, and it also means that the engine is never going to move and it's never going to be shaken around by the explosions inside it 
Whereas with this engine here, all of those nice features that we were using are suddenly not available. Um, but nevertheless, it does run. <laughs> There's another problem though that we'll see in a second. Um, so this is using the buoyancy source code that I have made a video of uh, and a tutorial of a little while ago and I've just put six fins onto the flywheel at the bottom and because of all these fixtures are overlapping with each other uh, it's a little bit hard to use the mouse to spin the engine to start it so I added a starter motor so to speak so if I hold down a key I can put some f uh, torque into the flywheel myself and I'll just give it two firings okay so I've li I've lifted <coughs> I've uh, I've let go of the starter motor now and it's running on its own power. So it has a fair amount of load. I don't really know how much but just from watching it it seems to have about the same amount of load as about halfway through those graphs that we were looking at. Which is probably quite good because that's where the highest power and torque is found and slowly but surely we are actually <laughs> accelerating this boat believe it or not um, and it's actually lifting the boat out of the water a little bit too because I think that's due to the the fins at the front are pushing down on the water okay so you can see that the boat is actually being powered entirely by those exploding fuel particles inside the engine but a funny thing happens here, and I haven't totally figured out why it happens, but when the entire body of the boat starts moving faster like this, the engine sort of inexplicably slows down, and it will stall now at some point. Okay, it's so just hanging in there. but. I think usually it stalls somewhere along here and I think that is just because of the fact that as this whole body is able to move around when it gets up to a speed the speed of the body can have an effect on the particles inside because the particles are um, they don't know that the boat's being shaken so they just sort of uh, how can I illustrate this? Actually, I'm not really sure what I'm talking about. But it's something to do with the boat moving sideways like that. That's the problem because if I just turn this again on, so I'm spinning the starter motor again. I'll get it started. Okay, starter motor's off. So it's not the fact that the the uh, paddles are in the water and it's slowing the engine down, it's nothing like that because it runs fine when the boat's not moving so it's just something to do with the fact that when this whole structure is moving sideways something gets kind of thrown off and I'm not really sure why that is to be honest uh, first it seemed like it was um, originally this fuel tank uh, fuel intake on the right was facing the other way if you remember from the original um, original design had both intakes coming from here and that caused a problem because when the boat started moving to the right all the fuel particles would kind of get jammed up uh, they would all go onto this side rather than coming into the right hand cylinder so that's why this fuel uh, intake has been pointing changed so that it's pointing to the right but it didn't really seem to make that much difference so I'm quite confused as to why that is but anyway wow this is a uh, this is quite dangerous isn't it I should give this guy a crash helmet if he's going to be traveling at this kind of speed <laughs> okay so uh, you can find the source code and the binaries for this on my website thanks for watching